Ahoy, mateys, and welcome to This Week in Nickelodeon History. It's a pleasure to welcome you aboard. My name is Captain Eric, and on this week's episode, we're going to be celebrating some anniversaries that have taken place in between the times of September 11th to September 17th. We're actually starting 32 years ago, all the way back in the year 1990, the old year of the uh, captain's birth, on September 14th, 1990, as we had the final episode of the Nickelodeon game show Make the Grade. Created by Michael Klinghoffer, the show ran for three seasons of 160 episodes. 30 years ago, on September 12th, 1992, we had the final episode of Salute Your Shorts. Created by Steve Slavkin, the show ran for two seasons of 26 episodes. 29 years ago, on September 11th, 1993, we had the premiere of Legends of the Hidden Temple. Created by David G. Stanley, Scott A. Stone, and Stephen Brown, the show ran for three seasons of 120 episodes before being revived for a single 13-episode season on The CW. Legends of the Hidden Temple... It's one of the greatest Nickelodeon game shows ever, perfectly combining physical challenges, puzzles, trivia, on top of a giant physical temple that you can run through with temple guards almost at every corner. It's an exciting time, a giant stone face Olmec uh, hosting the show alongside uh, Kirk Fogg, just an incredible experience. And a game show that I would have no problem signing up for today and knowing that I could dominate as well as anyone, uh, to to the effect that I actually auditioned for the CW remake of the uh, Legends of the Hidden Temple. Uh, Knowing the cast that they had selected, I I think they at least went with uh, those who seemed to be more in in the physical uh, fit appearance category, and also I think we're just prettier on television. I don't think the captain has... That much of a face for television. I've been told I have a face for radio. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what that means, but it sounds uh, sounds like an insult to me. Anyway, um, not to put myself down, I I auditioned alongside my friend. We weren't selected, but let me tell you, I don't care who came out on top of that game show. They are uncrowned champions until they go up against Captain Eric. That's just a fact, cold stone fact. Until you take me down in the temple. You don't get to hold up any sort of championship prize. Uh, I have been studying each and every one of those rooms for years. I know that temple inside and out, and the only thing that's going to be a curve is the kind of trivia that Olmec's going to throw my way. That's it. And I'm not even going to use that as an excuse. If I'm not up to the challenge in Olmec's trivia on that said day, then then that's it. But I, uh, I, I beg... I beg for my opportunity in the temple one of these days. It's an exciting time. If you haven't ever watched it, it's one of those game shows that honestly doesn't feel dated. A lot of the trivia is historical trivia over whatever the topic of the episode is. The physical challenges you can certainly watch, and the temple is an exciting time. So it's it's a perfectly fine experience, and it's on Paramount+. Plus. So it's one of the great reasons to have that service. And I am not sponsored at all by uh, by Paramount to say that. That's just my uh, my personal opinion. Um, although my personal opinion on the remake, why on the CW? I I don't understand. Um, Nickelodeon. I I get that Nick at Night is a great legacy content place to be, but in this day and age, Nick at Night should just be its own channel. And I know at this point. That does already exist in TV land, but Nick at Night can have its own channel, its own branding. That might seem silly for it to be 24-hour service, but it's called Nick at Night. But 
I I don't know. I I think there's just a untapped potential in the late night Nickelodeon market that at least from 9 p.m. until midnight, they are not taking advantage of. Think of late night adult versions of Double Dare or adults taking on Legends of the Hidden Temple like you saw in the CW, but the correct audience actually being advertised to that. And one might argue, well, if you're already an adult and you're already into Legends of the Hidden Temple and you know there's a remake, why not just watch it on the CW? I I just think it's a mishandling of the IP. And this isn't sour grapes over uh, over not being accepted. Like I said, I, I already know there's uncrowned champions out there, but uh, there is untapped potential in this area of Nick at Night for, you know, kind of like how Cartoon Network goes from Cartoon Network to Adult Swim or to Toonami. And I just feel like there's at least one night of the week where, hey, Saturday nights when it's Nick at Night, it's it's like back to snick levels of ooh this is more quote unquote edgier content for older kids but now hey when it's 10 p.m. on Saturday nights it's now content made for older Nickelodeon fans and you have Double Dare Legends of the Hidden Temple you bring back your reboot of Ren and Stimpy in that in that world that's how you correctly use those IPs and that's how you're going to get the most eyes on them And I'm not saying it has to be on Saturday nights specifically. It could be on Sundays. It could be on Mondays, Tuesdays. But one night a week on Nick at Night to devote that or even just calling it SNCC, that's a smart idea. 24 years ago, on September 15th, 1998, we had the premiere of Animorphs, an adaptation of a book series created by K.A. Applegate. The show ran for two seasons of 26 episodes. I uh, I never really read any of the books, but the covers of those books are as memorable to me as the Goosebumps covers are. I mean, not in the sense that I'm going to want to hang up any one of those covers on my wall, as I would a Goosebumps cover, but still, nonetheless, they are, they are covers that are eye-catching, and once you see them, I, I don't think there's a way you could forget them when you think of Animorphs. And if you've never seen an Animorphs cover, then I would just take five seconds of your day to Google Animorphs and to take a look at those covers. They were done by David Mattingly, who used uh, a um, a service called Elastic Reality, a program, not a service, uh, a program called Elastic Reality to take real photos of both the actors portraying these characters and of these animals. And the effects are one of a kind, and once you see them, memorable absolutely memorable. As far as the show is concerned, I enjoyed watching the show as a kid. I honestly don't remember many of like specific plot points or moments of dialogue, but I know that the morphing into the animals in the show was very much like the covers of the books taking like a, a step at a time. Like done obviously in in like a second or two. It's a TV show. They want this to look somewhat impressive, uh, but still nonetheless uh, I, I do have memories of Animorphs. It's it's worth looking back into, and if I ever have the time to watch the show, it, it might be something uh, I might get back into. 19 years ago, on September 13th, 2003, we had the premiere of Romeo on Nickelodeon, created by Frank Caswell Hyman, Thomas W. Lynch, and Percy Miller, who, if that name doesn't sound familiar, you might know him better as Master P. This was a show created for his son, Romeo. Romeo Miller at the front and center, uh, having a musical career on the side, and then, of course, making a Nickelodeon show to to entice him to an entirely new generation of kids. The show ran for three seasons of 53 episodes. 18 years ago, on September 12th, 2004, Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide premiered on Nickelodeon. Created by Scott Fellows, the show ran for three seasons of 54 episodes. On the exact same day 15 years ago, on September 12, 2004, we also had the premiere of Unfabulous. Created by Sue Rose, the show ran for three seasons of 41 episodes. 15 years ago, on September 16, 2007, we had the final episode of Drake and Josh. Created by Mr. Bailey, the show ran for four seasons of 52 episodes. Oh, I'm sorry, 57 episodes. I don't know where those other five went. 
Uh, but the final episode that aired on Nickelodeon wasn't, in fact, the final episode produced. Uh, the really big shrimp TV movie is, in fact, the official Drake and Josh series finale. I don't know. Well, I know Nickelodeon doesn't like really airing series finales like this that have a finality to them. They like shows to kind of continue on so that the reruns can air in nauseam. And you can still have a finale and still air reruns. I don't know why you can't have one and the other, but they aired really big shrimp before two other episodes. Helicopter, which aired two days after the TV movie, and then the final episode, Dance Contest, aired on September 16th, 2007. Technically, it's the second to last episode of Drake and Josh, and one could make the argument that in a 22-minute context, it's the last episode, so... That's pretty much correct, and obviously Nickelodeon wanted something big at the end of the summer to get more ratings, and they just said, why not just air the Drake and Josh TV movie a few weeks earlier, and and honestly, it's not that big of a deal. The end of that movie clearly has a finality moment for the entire series, but it, it's not that big of a deal to watch the episodes after it. 14 years ago, on September 12, 2008, we had the premiere of the Nickelodeon original movie, Gym Teacher, The Movie, directed by Paul Dinello and starring Christopher Maloney and Nathan Kress. The movie was eventually released on DVD on February 3, 2009. Also 14 years ago, on September 13, 2008, we had the final episode of El Tigre, The Adventures of Manny Rivera. The show was created by Jorge R. Gutierrez and Sandra Equea, and the show ran for 26 episodes. And I have to be honest in saying that I feel like El Tigre is up there as one of the most mishandled Nicktoons in their roster. Now, 26 episodes, that's a long time to spend in any world, but I felt like there was so much more to explore out there in not only Miracle City, the outskirts of that land, the the decisions that El Tigre had to continually make between his life as a hero, but then also the exciting life of rolling with your grandfather, who happens to be one of the greatest supervillains the world has ever seen. That's a pretty exciting premise, and it's not one that we see on every single superhero show, and the art style was gorgeous to me. So if you haven't seen El Tigre, The Adventures of Manny Rivera, I, I do think it's worth your time. It's a quick watch, 26 episodes, not that long. Get through it, and then let me know. Do you have any favorite characters, any favorite villains, favorite moments? I'd love to hear about it. Also 14 years ago, on September 15th, 2008, we had the premiere of My Family's Got Guts. The show is a return of the Nickelodeon Guts program, but with a new family twist. The show was presented by Ben Lyons and Asha Kirtan and ran for two seasons of 22 episodes. Unfortunately, though, it seems like season two of My Family's Got Guts never aired in North America. And instead of just talking about this again in, in a week or two, I might as well just cover this now. It it ended on September 27th, 2008, 14 years ago. Only that first season aired uh, elsewhere in the world. That second season got to be shown, but I guess it just didn't have enough ratings on on the North American Nickelodeon to justify airing that second season, which is uh, which is really sad. It's really sad to hear. I, I always think there's there's potential in this kind of content, but uh, I, I guess I'm always uh, wrong in that regard. Who knows? You let me know. Is there room for game show content on Nickelodeon? Is there just not an audience for that? Are kids not going to tune in to a game show when we when we have the internet? Should they maybe think of other ways to, you know, make these game shows viable? Nickelodeon should have a Twitch channel that has live versions of these game shows. Maybe with adults? I don't know. My Family's Got Guts had that idea, bring adults into the mix. Why not, uh, why not Double Dare? I'm not, no, we're not going back to the Legends thing. I'm definitely not. We're, we're getting away from that as quick as possible. 13 years ago, on September 12th, 2009, we had the premiere of The Troop on Nickelodeon. Created by Max Burnett, Greg Coolidge, and Chris Morgan, the show ran for two seasons of 40 episodes. Eleven years ago, on September 16th, 2011, we had the final episode of Go Diego Go. Created by Chris Gifford and Valerie Walsh Valdez, the show ran for five seasons of 80 episodes. 
Eight years ago, on September 13th, 2014, we had the premiere of Nikki, Ricky, Dicky, and Don on Nickelodeon. Created by Matt Fleckenstein, the show ran for four seasons of 82 episodes. Seven years ago, on September 12th, 2015, we had the premiere of Game Shakers on Nickelodeon. Kel Mitchell's return to his home on Nickelodeon. The show was created by Mr. Bailey and ran for three seasons of 61 episodes. Six years ago, on September 12th, 2016, we had the final episode of Breadwinners, created by Steve Borst and Gary Doodles. The show ran for two seasons of 40 episodes. And finally, we have one year ago on September 15th, 2021, we had the premiere of the NFL Slime Time on Nickelodeon, a rebroadcast of NFL games with an entire Nickelodeon twist on top of them. Slime geysers and SpongeBob, you can't go wrong. It's the best of both worlds coming together. It's my love for football, my love for Nickelodeon. Now, I'm not going to watch my football games on Nickelodeon, but... For the uh, replays, whenever I see the effects, I love to know that there's kids out there watching football for the first time and getting into it and hopefully finding the same love that I do for the game. And honestly, whoever comes up with ideas like this, it's the same level of ideas I have. It's just throwing a Nickelodeon twist onto something and it's bound to work. Now, some things it's not going to work, very obvious things it's not going to work, but there are things out there that when you can throw some slime on top of something... It absolutely works, and the entire NFL is one of those things. And for this week's top five, Captain Eric's top five of the week, I talked so much about the temple this week, I decided to go back in to let you know what my top five favorite rooms are inside of the Hidden Temple. Now, this is a list from years of watching that show, and uh, and I love them for different reasons, and hopefully, if you uh, if you are a fan of the temple, you understand some of these choices here. Number five is the heart room. I I love this idea of this room in the direct center of the temple. The look of it, the sounds. Anytime somebody went into the room, I I always loved that effect. Um, and just the idea of having the heart room at the center. Just I I love that. It's it's something about the temple that makes it feel alive. Number four on my list is the observatory. Uh, one of my favorite destinations in any sort of mansion or big landscape. Not that I go along those uh, personally, but in video games, anytime there's like a big household and there's a bunch of rooms to explore, inevitably there's always an observatory. And every time I come across one, I always tell myself, if I was in this situation right now, I would hang out in this room for a moment, especially if I was being chased by monsters and whatnot. I'll lock the door and I'll just stare in the telescope and mind my own business. But in the terms of the hidden temple, there is no telescope. It's mainly just playing around with that sundial. But if that's where they observe things, I want to be up there. Number three is the room of the three gargoyles. I am a big fan of puzzles. So any room that's going to have a puzzle element to it, I know I want to go in and I want to crush it as quick as possible. I always enjoyed doing that. That's why I enjoy escape rooms so much. Uh, the room of the three gargoyles, having to take each of the three gargoyle tops and being able to place them on each of the correct bases uh, and, and hopefully a decent amount of time so you can get out. Into number two, my second favorite room in the entire temple is the throne room and its various variations, but I always loved the possibility of not only multiple pathways happening in the throne room, but anytime somebody would sit down on the throne, which was the only way to unlock any of the doors if they were to open, but the possibility of a temple guard just coming up right behind you right when you sit down, it was an exciting time. I mean, personally, I wouldn't want to be in the throne room, but as far as watching the show, yeah, the throne room is one of my favorites. Number one should be pretty obvious, as I mentioned, my love for puzzles, and it is the Shrine of the Silver Monkey. The the most frustrating room that I can remember as a kid, because I thought it was a pretty simple puzzle. The monkey setup was incredibly simple, but for some reason, these kids would, would go on this show, they would get to that point, and all of a sudden they would just lose all abilities of thinking. I, I you know, they're children. And I'm not saying this as an adult, 
These were my thoughts as a kid watching this. Now, in the first season, can't really, you know, blame anybody for not knowing what's going on. It's the first of its kind. But after that, once they started airing on television, if you're a fan of this and then you go and find yourself actually competing on the show, you'd think somebody would remember, oh, yeah, monkey goes forward and then the, the hands go forward and then the head goes forward. And these kids would just know, nope. like even by the fourth season, it was still like, huh, once they'd get in that room, they would just simply forget all knowledge of this monkey ever existing, and and they would just simply forget. Uh, it was frustrating to watch, but it was always exciting, especially when someone was able to go in that room and just slam down those pieces together with such confidence. Boom, boom, boom. Door opens on your way, and then you're just left like, all right, I hope this guy or this gal gets out of this temple. I'm rooting for you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be our time together aboard. I really appreciate you all for coming along and, and joining me to celebrate some Nickelodeon anniversaries. Don't forget to join me next week for another glorious episode. But in the meantime, you can also reach Captain Eric at NickelodeonHistory at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at I'm Ready Podcast and on Instagram at SpongeBob Podcast. You can also follow my new Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash thecaptaineric. I'll have that in the podcast description as well. But also, please check out my other podcast, I'm Ready, a SpongePod Squarecast dropping every Thursday on most conceivable podcasting platforms. You can also subscribe to the Captain Eric YouTube channel. And don't forget to hit that bell so you can be notified anytime the captain puts something out. You can also purchase new and updated merch in the Redbubble link, either in the podcast description or from the link in any of my socials. Anything that comes in from my projects goes directly back into my projects, and it's always appreciated. As always, mateys, please stay safe, be kind to one another, and come aboard again to another episode of This Week in Nickelodeon History. On the Lord, hut, hero, hut, Nick. On the Lord, hut, hero, hut, Nick, Nick. On the Ricky Tiggy Low, while living number one, Nickelodeon.